I want to read again, please, in Psalm 145. Psalm 145, verse 3. <clears throat> Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. I want you to look down at verse 6. Just the last five words. I will declare thy greatness. So his greatness is unsearchable in verse 3. And the writer says, I will declare thy greatness in verse 6. So let's turn to the New Testament. I'll just read one more passage. It's Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> Verse 33, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I've been thinking of four passages in the Bible. I'm sure there are many more that could be used as an example of this. But I'm thinking of four passages that really contain a very strong paradox. Of course, it is not a paradox, but it would seem that way to us. We read, for instance, in Psalm 145, that his greatness is unsearchable. And yet, the man who wrote that and believed it said, I will declare thy greatness. If it's unsearchable, how could he declare it? Ephesians chapter 3 that we read after the breaking of bread this morning, verses 18 and 19, contain a paradox just like that. Paul is actually praying. That is the greatest of Paul's prison, prison prayers, by the way, in Ephesians 3. And he's praying that these believers might be able to comprehend with all saints what is the height and depth and length and breadth of the love of Christ? He wants them to comprehend it. But then he says it passes knowledge. So how can they comprehend it if it passes knowledge? Perhaps Matthew 11 will help us a lot. Those, those are beautiful words, and I'm certain many Christians here can quote them. The Lord Jesus is praying, not Paul, but the Lord himself. And he said, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And then he makes an amazing statement. No man knoweth the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And no man knoweth the Son save the Father. Now, if you just stop there, you wouldn't have a problem. But if you go down to verse 29, you'll find that he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So if he's not known by any but the Father, how can we learn of him? There is another passage which uh, I, I think is perhaps uh, even more like that. It's Colossians chapter 2. And in Colossians chapter 2, Paul is desiring that these believers would have a full, and this is a very strong expression, a full assurance of understanding. And that's kind of, he's really using a, a naval term, a, a ship going, a, a, a sea going term, because it actually means a vessel that term was used for a vessel that was under full sail and fully equipped for a voyage. That they might have a full assurance of understanding. And then he says, this is quite amazing. Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
Now immediately you would know that if they can have a full assurance of understanding that those great treasures of truth that are hid in the Lord Jesus are not hidden so they cannot be appreciated. But what all these scriptures prove is what I was trying to speak on at the close of the breaking of bread. When we come to the Bible, when we come to God's revelation of his son, we are finite creatures. And this is infinite truth. I think I can say this again, and I won't maybe bore you too badly, that although we are finite creatures, we have great longings for the infinite. And that's so obvious to us every day we live. Is there anything really in this world that measures up to filling the heart, satisfying the soul, giving us really a final answer to anything? Not in this world. I know a lot of questions. I'm sorry that in many cases, I don't know the answers to those questions. So there are many things in this world, but none of them, none of them, nor all of them put together, can ever fill our hearts. And I mentioned the words of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 this morning. I'm going to quote them to you more accurately now. Uh, the first part of verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 3 has been made very well known by a man in the state of Minnesota. What are the first words of verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 3? He hath made everything beautiful in his time. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. What's the rest? He hath set eternity in man's hearts. Our English Bible doesn't read like that, as you well know. Our English Bible reads, he has set the world in their heart. But that's not really the word at all. It's eternal ages. It's the ages of the ages. So into the heart, not just of believers, but of all mankind, God has set eternity in their hearts. And I, and I think that perhaps there are people who are far more influenced when they hear the message of the gospel preached than we understand they are. Because they recognize, they must recognize here is an answer. I don't have it anywhere else. And here is an answer to that inner longing for something that truly lasts, something that is truly satisfying, something that is eternal, like the, the great uh, Roman emperor when he was reviewing his troops, some of the best trained troops the world has ever known. He had finished his review and a tear dropped from his eye. And one of his advisors said to him, it, 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 does, does something displease the emperor? He said, isn't there anything that lasts? That's been the cry of man through the ages. Isn't there anything that lasts? Not in this world. But God has said eternity in man's hearts. So I'm going to try to speak to you, if I can, about things that are beyond our finite minds. And yet, in every one of the cases I've mentioned to you so far, in spite of the fact that this is infinite truth, we are invited, we are encouraged, we are urged to look into infinite truth. Can we ever come to the end of it? No. That's why it's infinite. So, I don't really believe, dear believer, what I've heard said at times. I haven't heard it said for a long time, so maybe no one says that anymore. But I can remember back a number of years ago, I remember men from a platform saying, uh, Earth is the school, and when we get to heaven, we'll be at home and there'll be no more school. A man I love very dearly said something like that, but not like that. Mr. Mervyn Paul used to say, earth is a school, heaven is home. 
Uh, I had the deepest respect to him, for him. He was like a father to me. Uh, I lived in his home when I was a boy, so Mr. Mervyn Paul was very dear to my heart. But, you know, I, I had a conversation with him about this when he was near the end of his life. And I said, will we stop learning when we get to heaven? He said, no, we'll just begin. In fact, that introduced a story that he told me that has stuck with me ever since. He said, the devil came after me. He was seriously ill. His body was diseased. He was dying. He said, the devil came to me and said, Mervyn, you're all done. You're all finished. This is the end. <laughs> and he said, I opened my Bible and I put my finger on Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7. And I said, there you old devil, just look at that. What does it say? In the ages to come, he will show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Only the ages of the ages could ever satisfy our hearts. No wonder the word of God answers our deepest need. No wonder we find in it that which can meet every desire and longing in our being. Nothing else does. You know, an element of all worship is wonder. The old Puritans and some of our preachers, including dear Mr. Maxwell, used to often quote these words, when we have ceased to wonder, we have ceased to worship. So there's an element of wonder. Was there not an element of wonder in the worship this morning? Oh, there was a great element of wonder, of awe, of a holy awe. That that, that that holy God who inhabits eternity, that he could look down and see me, a poor, wretched sinner, less than a speck in his universe, and that he could so love me as to give up his only son to die in my place. You see, I'm one of those, I'm one of those simple kind of Christians that believe if I were the only sinner that ever needed a savior, the Lord Jesus would have died in my place. Do you believe that? I, that's one of those things that's beyond our comprehension. That's one of those infinite things that we cannot really fully grasp. Nevertheless, there are many things like that that are blessedly true. So in our worship, there is an element of wonder and awe. Unseen we love thee, we sing, dear thy name. But when our eyes behold, with joyful wonder we'll proclaim, the half has not been told. That wonder produces worship. Now I have some very simple things. The meeting is going to be over in about 10 minutes. So let me just, let me just tell you some things I've enjoyed about God's greatness. His greatness is unsearchable. That is, his greatness is transcendent. And yet that greatness has been revealed. I, I love the words of John 1 and 18. In fact, I don't, know, I don't know any portion of the Bible that has greater meaning to us than those 18 verses of John 1. And John 1 and 18 says, no man has seen God at any time. Now, is that true? No man has seen God at any time. Just stop for a moment. Did Moses not see him? No. Did Isaiah not see him? No. How do I know that? Because the Lord Jesus said, no man has seen God at any time. That's plain enough, isn't it? Oh, I know Moses saw, uh, you know, this, this, is, this belongs to modern technology, so maybe you don't want to relate this to Mount Sinai, but what Moses really saw was the afterglow. You know what an afterglow is, don't you? Well, that's what he saw. He saw the afterglow. God had said to Moses, there shall no man see my face and live. No man has seen God at any time. And 1 Timothy 6 tells us why no man has seen God at any time. He's the invisible God. And listen, this is what it says, who no man has seen nor can see. Are we going to see God? Even Job had that assurance. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And after 
Skin worms have destroyed my body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. <laughs> We're going to see God? <laughs> we surely are. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten in the bosom of the Father, he has led him forth into full revelation. Mr. John Smith, some of you knew who he was. He was the son of the great pioneer John Smith, who came from Scotland with Mr. Monroe and Mr. Ross and labored to see assemblies planted in North America. And uh, his son was a very godly man. We had high respect for him. I counted it one of the great privileges of my life to speak at his funeral. And he said to me one day, there's a problem. He said, when we get to heaven, who are we going to see? I was all ears, and I didn't even attempt to, to answer his question. I just looked at him, and he smiled. He said, is there anything about God that the Lord Jesus Christ does not fully reveal? He has led him forth into full revelation. Therefore, we are able to see the greatness of God that is unsearchable. And we're able to see that greatness in the person of the Lord Jesus. And in what way? Well, just let me give you a few examples because I cannot, I cannot give you many. Almighty power. Almighty power. The Lord Jesus is the one by whom all things were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. He's the mighty creator. And what's more, Colossians 1 tells us he's the upholder. He's the sustainer. He holds all things together by his power. What power? What power? Can we understand it? No. It's far beyond our, our grasp. I read to you last Lord's Day a statement from a geneticist who uh, publicly is supposed to believe in evolution but in his heart cannot believe it because it's impossible. And uh, I quoted these words to you from that dear man that when he looked at the wonder and his particular area of microbiology, his investigation of the program, the writing that is found in the DNA code. Uh, he said that we, don't, we can't read the words, but we're just learning how to identify the letters of the DNA code. And then he said, did it come about by chance, by evolution? He said, that is absolutely impossible. It was engineered by genius beyond genius. So what are we looking at? His greatness is unsearchable. The greatness of his wisdom. The greatness of his power. I thought of the absolute holiness of God. His perfect righteousness. The Lord Jesus in John 16 says, said that the Holy Spirit was come to convince the world of righteousness because I go to the Father. What did that mean? It meant that as long as he was here, he was the light of the world, he said, as long as he was in the world. As long as he was in the world, he was the display of God's holiness and God's righteousness. Can we understand that? No, his greatness is unsearchable. It's beyond our comprehension. Perfect holiness in a man walking on earth. There are mysteries about the incarnation that we cannot grasp. They are beyond us. But oh, how we long to learn more. No wonder the Lord Jesus said, no man knoweth the Son save the Father, and yet take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Do you long to learn more? You can. And you'll never come to the end of that learning. So I believe for all eternity we'll go on learning about him, the infinite one. Think of his immeasurable love, just for a moment, if you will. Think of love that knows no measure. Think of love that transcends human thought. 
We sometimes sing a beautiful hymn, On such love my soul still ponder, Love so rich, so great, so free, Say while lost in holy wonder. Yes, there is wonder. Why, O oh Lord, such love to me? So we wonder. His greatness is unsearchable. The greatness of his love is beyond our comprehension. Think of the unfathomable depths of his mercy. Dear Christian, do you have loved ones not saved? I do. I don't want to say too much about this. I get on my knees sometimes in the middle of the night. And if you have a burden for loved ones, I can understand it. But listen, the depth of his mercy is so great. It's higher than the heavens and deeper than the deepest sea. Don't ever underestimate the unfathomable mercy of God. It's sufficient. It's enough. It can reach any lost soul. I've already referred to the exceeding riches of his grace. And I'm certain that you understand that when Paul said, in the ages to come, He's referring to eternal ages. Not only a millennial reign of a thousand years, but a new heaven, a new earth, the ages of the ages. And in the ages of the ages, he will show. I love that. that that's what, to me one of the most precious truths that I know. You see, when the Lord Jesus was here, he was showing the Father. In him you could see the Father's glory shine. Is that going to stop in eternity? No. In fact, that's again what 1 Timothy chapter 6 is saying. In its time, he shall show. Who shall show? Christ. Shall show what? Shall show the glory of God. And that passage is actually referring to an eternal display of the glory of God in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing lacking. And it's infinite. And his greatness is unsearchable. But I have a very practical way of applying this to myself and to you. This one who, whose greatness is unsearchable. Wonder of wonders. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, an amazing passage. I, I think it's one of the most precious passages in the Old Testament. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? that the everlasting God, the Lord, the, uh, the, uh, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. No searching of his understanding. And that has been very precious. I'll tell you why. He cares for you. How much? How tenderly? How personally? Well, I'm going by the words of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. He said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. And, and you see sparrows every day. Do you ever look at those little birds and think of the care of God? Not one sparrow falls. What's a sparrow worth anyway? Not one sparrow falls without your heavenly father. Was he teaching a lesson? Yes, here's the lesson. Fear not. You're of more value than many sparrows. Does God care for you? Does this God whose greatness is unsearchable, this God of whom there is no searching of his understanding, who is infinite in power and might and dominion and control, does he care for you? Yes, he cares in a most tender, personal way, so that there's nothing too small for his notice. If a sparrow's not too small for him to see, then surely nothing in your life, nothing that ever happens, can be beneath his notice. He cares. This infinite God, this eternal God, this God whose greatness is unsearchable, 
He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. God, help us to trust him and to enjoy infinite truth even though we have finite minds. Shall we pray?